Life is all about learning, and tonight we with you would like to share some time around the Word of God. This evening, we would like to help you in deciphering between the doctrines of men and the true doctrine of God with respect to the Bible. What has mankind changed and altered to become myth and legend? What now clouds the truth and masks the reality between life and death, and in particular, as concerning our topic tonight, the truth about heaven and hell? Now, many years and cultures, world powers, and different governments have all had their turn through the history of the time, each with their own beliefs, each also changing and adapting principles, laws, customs, and assimilating them into their own design ways, religion, law, politics, and lives to suit their times and their situations. Sometimes it was for survival, sometimes for good, and sometimes it was just simply for control. This is important to understand because gradual changes over time go unnoticed until something significant happens to highlight what has occurred. We will ask you, do you really understand the doctrinal concept of life and death as truly taught in the Bible? Will the true meaning change the way you think about God himself? Who does it really affect and how? Are our thoughts of heaven and hell based on preconceived teachings which are ages old? And does it really matter what we believe? Or is it just about being good and bad? With all the advanced technology available to us today, we have many advantages that should help us in our daily lives concerning work, living standards, health, education, and others, and it does. We have advanced more in the last two decades than we have in the last 200 years. Technology growth is so fast that in keeping up with it is almost an impossible thing to do. But with this growth and advancement, there has come a newfound strength that has empowered many to believe only in themselves, trusting and putting faith in mankind's desire to grow and know everything, becoming a resilient and dogmatic view that there is no one beside us. We are not the created, but we are the creator. For the most, it seems to deny all except ourselves, the human being, master of our own destiny, with our own understanding and our own abilities. This growth has altered our thinking and ambitions, but ultimately, it should have opened our eyes to the finite situation we are in, with respect to resources, life and wealth, issues of health, recycling, conserving, being clean, and environmentally friendly. Opening our eyes with technology through NASA has shown the vastness and great expanse that surrounds our galaxy, the complexity and power that is at play which affects and determines so many physical, earthly attributes as it does our planet's destiny, but shows dramatically how small a part we are in the universe itself. The stars that surround us and the planetary system which we revolve in is just the beginning, and for many with the advancement of education, mind and understanding of the physical powers that be, a simple out is to say, it all just happened. A chain of events which sparked order and life in the masses of eternity of space. This easy answer both negates responsibility and meaning to us and everything around us, but with tonight's subject understood with a little more clarity, we will hopefully show you that there is more to us than just a lonely planet in a lonely universe. There is a plan, a purpose, a design, which gives us being and it gives us reason. I hope to show you that through this topic, a true understanding of the Bible doctrine can really alter the concept of what the Bible really means and what it actually is teaching to show you that many things now believed are from age-old teachings, modified and altered to suit individuals' own purposes and control, which have all been mixed into one pot to create a warped and bent image of who God is and what it is that is laid out before mankind 
as being his purpose and his role. For instance, the mixture of folklore and false teaching has given the idea of fear that one may receive eternal punishment and torment for disobedience, and eternal peace as a reward for those who only do good in their mortal lives. This concept of good and evil is largely claimed as being scriptural teaching and religious bashing. In part, this is right, but in truth it does not come from the Bible teaching itself but man-made claims distorting Bible teaching. There are issues of being good and peaceable in one's life. There is also the battle of negotiating one's own desire and will and imposing it on others, particularly bad when evil intent is the only goal. The Bible does teach reward for those who try to follow the Creator's plan and purpose, but the only punishment taught and preached in the Bible is that of death a natural course and state of being for all life upon earth at this time. So, where is heaven? Where is hell? Who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? If you do, who sends you? Or do you decide? What does the Bible actually say? Firstly, let's consider a little more about this modifying of beliefs. This was particularly strong and well practiced in the first century religious teaching. Religion and customs and customs were deliberately distorted to help control the masses. This practice had even been given a name by those who did it. It was known as double doctrine or double truth doctrine. It became known and used by so called great and educated men of society in both Greece and Rome men as such as Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras, Aristotle, and many others. All were either philosophers, theologians, teachers, historians, but even statesmen and governors developed and used this practice. It was both accepted and deemed to be a good practice. It boiled down to the simple fact of controlling the common people. What was good for them in the eyes of those that had to lead and rule over them. Again, this is important because gradual change goes unnoticed by all until something significant happens to highlight what has actually happened. Especially in the case of the Romans, it was expedient for the rulers to achieve proper control and rule over their subjects to achieve full authority. The Greek writer Polybius wrote on the history of the Roman Republic. In his section on Roman government concerning the teaching from early philosophers to the people, he wrote, But as the people universally are fickle and in constant with irregular desires, precipitate in their passions and prone to violence, there is no way to restrain them but by the dread of things unseen and by the pageantry of terrifying fiction. The ancients therefore acted not absurdly nor without good reason, when they invented the notion concerning the gods and the belief of eternal punishments. This is all part of the gradual change and breakdown of true beliefs and a combination of change connected with the very thing that we are looking at now where the changes and false beliefs have been installed by those who rule and rule to gain the control of the masses, mainly with fear and scare tactics all the while distorting the truth and the actual reality of the belief. So what is the actual reality? We need to sort fact from fiction. What is real and what is made up? A proper and true understanding can only be developed by careful study and consideration. Tonight we want to introduce to you the basic concepts of where we need to go and what is it that we need to do to decipher in order to get a proper understanding and what you will find will surprise you. It's not all as we hear. You may or may not realize that the Bible was written in two languages, Hebrew and Greek, and only with proper investigation, interpretation and reading the text in context will you be able to know the proper and true meaning to topics like ours tonight. 
For instance, there are ten words in the Bible which, which relate to our topic tonight, six Hebrew and four Greek. Before you now on the screen are the six Hebrew words that when translated to English relate to celestial bodies or high above. Now as they disappear, we will see the four Greek words again, and they will disappear to reveal the English words translated from them. Words such as heaven, heavens, clouds, celestial, high, sky, and air. Clearly, there is no problem as to where heaven is, and what the Bible is talking about when it refers to the heaven in the Bible text, whether Greek or Hebrew. By the use of the words in scripture, we will need to know in what context these Hebrew and Greek words are used. To be factual and true to each word and its use, it needs to be looked at and read in context with the verses around it. For instance, let's look at the word heaven as being used in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Here is a simple example of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray and showing them that their God to whom they were praying was in heaven or high above them. And similar in the Old Testament, we can go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Again here the preacher was making it clear that God is above, and man below. In each instance we can see a clear description given of where heaven is, and who is actually there. And as the earth has its upper atmosphere, space has its stars and comets, meteors, black holes, and various other celestial bodies, this is the place the Bible teaches as heaven. This is the abiding place of God himself. The word in the Old Testament comes from the Hebrew word Sheol. The same word that has been translated pit or grave in English. So simply, any time the word is used in the Old Testament, it is referring to the grave where the dead are buried. It is only fanciful, contrived and fictional ideas of eternal fire and torment that have been taken from scripture completely out of context in order to fill others with dread and fear. In trying to keep them subject and in control, using other forms and words out of context from the Bible, even a fallen angel has been described as its keeper of this horrific place, a master enslaving people into an eternal torment to punish them. Religious or not, we know enough about our planet to know that there is no subterranean place of this kind. This is complete and fanciful fiction and foolish thinking. The Testament is slightly different in that there are three different Greek words used. The first, Hades, meaning the same as the Hebrew word Sheol, that we just looked at again, meaning the pit or grave. Now the next word, Gehenna, is a place, and indeed it is a place of fire. A place of fire continually, in fact, being called Gehenna, the link is easily made. But it was no eternal damnation, place or place of torment, just simply a rubbish dump just south of Jerusalem. The fire was kept burning so that the rubbish did not stink, and of course, better for those who dwelt in the city. Bodies were committed to Gehenna, but they were the bodies of criminals who were punished with death, and instead of graves being dug, their bodies were thrown into this fire. The last Greek word, Tataru, is used only once in the Bible and as always needs to be looked at. But this particular case merits special attention and time to be fully understood. 
why it has only been used once. Some meaningful time needs to be set aside and given to looking at this verse in detail. And when done, it will be seen that, is, that as in every other case in the Bible, it also teaches simply of the grave and of the pit where people go to die. To further help in our understanding of the topic for tonight, we can look at the records of people whose lives have been recorded in the Bible, written down for not only lessons to learn from, but also in helping to explain God's principles and purpose as a whole. For example, we can look at the life of Abraham. He was one such person. He was the great patriarch of Israel. His life is recorded in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapters 11 through to 17. We find that Abraham lived in a time when God would speak to people through messengers. Abraham and his family lived in a place called Ur, it was Ur of the Chaldees. They left this place with his family and travelled along the trade routes north to a place called Haran, where they settled. Whilst there, God spoke with Abraham and told him to go to a strange land that he would show him, and from that place God would make him a great nation. So Abraham took Sarah his wife and Lot his nephew with his wife also. And they all went into a strange land, a land called Canaan. The strange land is a sojourner. God took Abraham to a high place and told him to look northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land he saw he would give unto him, and that his seed or children would become a great nation, and would be counted as a multitude in number, and he would have this place forever. For his faith and trust in God, God made this a covenant promise between them both. Abraham through his life showed continual faith and belief in what God had told him, further showing his reliance in God and what he had said. Another way in which he showed his faith was in the fact that his wife Sarah was barren and could not have children at the time of these promises. Yet Abraham did not question or disbelieve what God had told him. And finally, at the old age of Abraham and Sarah, had their first child, Isaac. Two very important things about this particular record are here. That one, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was barren, and she was at that time unable to have children. And the second important thing is that Abraham just got up and left. He believed, had faith in God, that God would do what he said and just followed his command. Faith and belief and trust are very big factors when it comes to believing in God, especially today when there is no open vision, prophets, or direct communication with God. So this act of faith and trust show God Abraham's ability and willingness to believe in him and follow his word. Abraham continued to show his faith and trust in God through his life, and God made a covenant relationship with Abraham. Both Abraham and Sarah had their names changed. And the birth of a nation did happen. The nation we know as Israel today. David, or King David, may be another key character in the Bible you may have heard of. Certainly key to the promises that we have just seen given to Abraham. David was the eighth son of Jesse, being the youngest. He was the shepherd for his father's flock. By no means a job for the faint-hearted. It is recorded that in keeping his father's flock that he had to ward off both a lion and a bear to protect them, killing them both. David is also recorded as having musical abilities, but his most notable feature was that of him being fearless. He trusted impl implicitly and he feared nothing if he thought he was doing God's will and the work of his God. But of course probably the most known and understood event in his life was the battle with a giant named Goliath. Most people know of a phrase or have even used it themselves, a David and Goliath battle. The phrase relates to a situation where the small guy is going up against the giants or the big guys. The enemy of Israel had invaded Israel 20 kilometers west of Bethlehem. Saul, the king at that time, went out to meet and oppose this invader with his army. 
and met them at the battlefield, the valley of Elah, lay between them. David, having three brothers who were in the army, Jesse, his father, sent him out to see how they were. This is how David met Goliath. He heard the defiant cry of this warrior and how he taunted and ridiculed the Israelite army and he wanted a single warrior to come forward to fight. He blasphemed and cursed the God of Israel. This incensed the fearless David who went out to fight this man as a shepherd boy, knowing that it was God who was going to fight and destroy this enemy. The outcome, of course, was that the shepherd boy slew the giant enemy of Israel and won the battle for Israel for them that day. Through this act, and from that point forward, David grew and quietly strengthened himself and waited patiently for God's timing to make him king and set up a throne. This showed David's trust and faith in God also. David fought many battles for Israel, and all with God at his side. He showed his courage and faith, so God included him into the promises that he gave to Abraham. He was not only a descendant of Abraham, but was promised great status in these promises, and his family line would continue on to be the same line as the future king, the king to God's final kingdom. This king would sit on David's throne also. This linked David to Abraham, and now to the Son of God, Jesus himself, making his throne one that would last forever. What lessons do we learn by reading of the lives of the faithful in the Bible? How are these events linked to our topic tonight? First we must know and acknowledge that God is consistent and true in his word. The two men we have looked at very briefly tonight are just the tip of the iceberg in showing how God's plan is going to work out through the lives of those that are willing to believe in him. Being consistent, God's law states, all who sin must die. As all mankind, these men also were both sinners, and by the law had to die. This being no different today, they have indeed passed away, and not even their tombs or graves exist. But what stands out and teaches us God's way and purpose? We find that this is recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. And there are two verses in particular, verses 13 and 39. God has promised them life, eternal life, a throne, a land. And in reading this chapter, we will find and we'll see that there are others also recorded who have died in faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Has God not fulfilled his promise to these faithful people? Are they forgotten? Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. This is only true of man. We are not round long enough to remember those of centuries past. But for God the answer is no. God just hasn't finished with his plan yet. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 he wrote for us to understand. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. After death there is nothing more. It's like we say at night when we sleep. We are dead to the world. Now is the time to learn, and act, to do, and to make the right choice. Nowhere in scripture does it teach that after death that one might go to heaven. There is no link in the Bible to death and heaven going. And as we intimated earlier, it will be only by careful study and follow up in learning about the Hebrew and Greek words in all their verses will you completely clarify and see that heaven going is neither a scriptural doctrine or Bible-based teaching. 
it is a myth. Whether going up to heaven or going down to a fiery hell where you die, it is a myth. How does this affect us? We have to know the truth. God's word is sure and it is consistent in all its teaching. We can rely on it as others before us have. So we can be sure to believe and to learn to trust in it. It gives us hope and a future and a being and a belonging. They are promises which are sure. We want to and can show you that there is life through the resurrection of the dead. So there is no fear in death itself. The Bible teaches resurrection from the dead. It teaches a kingdom set up on earth. There is a reward for those who are faithful. There is hope for those who believe in the living God. Just knock and it will be opened unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Join us in learning about the way to God and to life. God bless.